It's a completely free of charge online resource for everyone with an interest in hernias. An educational program with three main aims, eight chapters and the world's leading experts with certification on completion. You can attend lectures, view videos or look up information keeping you up to date with the latest views and technology via a user-friendly interactive platform. We're taking hernia care further together. So visit websurge.com and start your journey today. IRCAD and WebSurge are pleased to introduce Hernia Basecamp, a new free educational platform accessible on the WebSurge website. It's a comprehensive and trackable online training platform for all topics related to hernia and abdominal wall repair. In this first phase, you'll find on the Hernia Basecamp a very comprehensive resource that will meet all your educational needs regarding inguinal hernia surgery. It is based on the syllabus established by the Board of the Abdominal Wall Surgery Section of the European Union of Medical Specialists. This makes a unique learning tool for those considering taking this diploma examination. Many of the world's leading hernia specialists give you a broad and up-to-date overview of all relevant topics. We have also partnered with scientific societies and conferences to select the important and up-to-date lectures to deliver the most relevant information. The interactivity, quality of information, teaching resources, and accreditation to the continuing medical education program makes Hernia Basecamp a unique educational support for all physicians who want to fully understand abdominal surgery as a surgical specialty. So, we are very proud to offer you an NBS reliable, certified and up-to-date information selected by experts in the field. A free interactive platform to learn at your own pace. The ability to track your progress and collect CME points in the future. You can watch what you want, when you want. You can review recent conferences and webinars wherever you want. So, Explore and start here your journey with the Ernia Base Camp and Web Search. So, welcome. Welcome to this uh, first ever Ernia Base Camp webinar. I'm uh, Bernard Almeine, I'm a staff surgeon here in the University Hospital of Strasbourg. And I'm also a staff member of the uh, IRCAT Friends. So uh, I have the pleasure to be the chair of this uh, session and I have uh, two prestigious uh, guests with me to today. Uh, prestigious because these are the guys who are behind this uh, fabulous project, which is the Ernia Base Camp. So Barbara first, maybe introduce yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Barbara East. I'm a surgeon from Prague. I'm also the Secretary for Quality of the European Hernia Society, and I'm a co-secretary of the UM Subdominal Wall Section. Okay, set. So on the other side, I have another partner who is also involved in the development of this, uh, this uh, fabulous uh, program. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Andrew Debo. If the Debo, like in French? Debeau. Absolutely. Okay, Andrew. Yeah, you thank you very yourself? much. I'm Andrew Debeau. I'm a surgeon from Edinburgh, Scotland. And for my sins, I was past president of the British Hernia Society. And currently, I'm general secretary of the European Hernia Society. And it was a privilege to work on Hernia Base Camp. Thank you very much. So, we will talk a little bit about this project, Hernia Base Camp. So, Barbara, what is the story of this project? Well, um... There, there are a few women behind this project. Uh, Ruth Hodgkinson, she's an extremely creative person. And uh, it was some hard women brainstorming that started this whole thing. And uh, Andrew joined us, luckily. So we, we had some slaves as well to work on this. Um, and um, 
in 2020, we've started the UM section of the abdominal wall surgery. We needed a textbook for it, and we needed high quality textbook. We needed something verified by experts. We needed something dynamic, free to use. And um, that's, that's basically the story behind it. Uh, so we understand the project, but um, what, what have you included in this project? So basically, uh, we at Aircad, we are very pleased to host this uh, project on web search, so everybody knows uh, web search. Uh, but what, is, what are the characteristics of uh, your project? Uh, what are you looking for? Is it just for fun? Is it well organized? What is the strategy of this program? The, the, it is very well organized. It's sorted to chapters. We call them camps because it's all about mountaineering and we all want to reach the Mount Everest of hernia surgery one day. So we have um, turned it into eight different chapters, which will take you to the peak eventually. Uh, it has been CME accredited, so you can get up to 30 CME credits, which are recognized by UMs. So it's something very important to keep your registration going in many countries. Uh, it's not static, it's very dynamic, it's flexible, you can watch it in your own time. And I think what's, what's the most important part is that it's expert-led, expert-verified, and it's free to use for anybody, no matter where on the globe you live work you can really get educated by the best of the best out there thank you andrew um we're talking about abdominal wall uh, repair um, so today we will be talking about inguinal hernia so what are the other topics that you have included in the base camp well, well i should say that i'm delighted to be a part of hernia base camp although for me i think it was uh, wrong place wrong time and male frailty. Wrong place was Edinburgh, wrong time. Dr. East came to join me as a fellow and male frailty. It's very hard saying no to two very bright and enthusiastic uh, women. But I think moving on uh, from that, clearly um, hernia base camp is something that has to uh, devolve, it has to be active. And while it was set up around the UM's uh, AWS syllabus, it's more than that. It's a learning uh, uh, opportunity for anyone, including myself, uh, to keep up to date, to, um, to take trainees, perhaps you know they're gonna do a particular operation with you in two days time, you can say watch video 29 and 37 and you'll come to theater prepared. Maybe you're planning a conference and you're saying, well, lectures 50 to 55 are the core learning for the start of this online training so there's a lot of potential to use something like this not just purely for an examination but as a learning resource as web search has done since its inception in, in 20 uh, in, in 2000 yeah. <clears throat> by experience we know that surgery is changing all over the time uh, so you have to update that systematically and so how are you proceeding to give these updates and how is it introduced in the program? So maybe the students are aware of these updates or how can you manage that? I think we have to be active with these things. So we're looking at that because this is still a new thing. Hernia Base Camp is only 18 months old. In fact, it's not even 18 months old. So it's looking to be more interactive, being able to notify uh, uh, people who are registered of new things uh, coming out. Guidelines will change. Uh, that's one of the interesting things about Hernia Base Camp is that for the first time, it's given CME points to read in guidelines. You read the guideline, you answer the questions, and you have the potential to have uh, appraisal points uh, from that. So that's a really cool thing uh, to do. But you're right, it's dynamic. And we rely obviously on the team to keep it up to date, but we also rely on our users to get back to us and say, hang on a minute, that lecture is now a little bit old, there's new evidence, mm -hmm. it's high time that you updated uh, that, that uh, video lecture. Barbara, some comments? I think Andrew said everything important already. So. Yeah. Okay, so do we have uh, other points that you want to uh, address regarding this uh, project, Barbara? Um, no, not not really. No? I think we will have some time at the end. Okay. Hopefully. Andrew. Hernia base camp for all your hernia needs. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so we're gonna move to the topic of uh, today. So can you introduce the topic, Barbara? Why did you choose that? 
Well, I was given that topic, actually. I didn't choose that and I'm not any anatomist. I hated anatomy at medical school and I feel like I'm about to be examined. So wish me so luck. So who chose that? Uh, Ruth did. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you have, you have the, the, the <laughs> difficult lecture. So uh, probably we can switch to your lecture. I think if it's ready. David, and just for the audience, uh, just one mention is that this is an interactive session. So uh, you are on the Zoom platform. So today people know Zoom uh, very well. So you can introduce a question on the Q&A and uh, I personally will check your questions. And after some of the lecture, or maybe at the end of this uh, webinar, we will address your questions. So feel free to comment on the talks, uh, comments, questions, and uh, we will collect that. Okay, Barbara, it's your turn. Thank you very much. So as I said, instead, I'm just going to tell you how not to get lost in all the ligaments in the groin, because Andrew is going to talk about the other anatomical structures, so it's no point to, to repeat it. And I have to thank my friend, colleague, surgeon, and a, and a great anatomist, Dr. Pastor, who actually helped me put this lecture together. As I said before, I hated anatomy for all these reasons when I was a medical student, but being a surgeon for quite some time now, I'm reinventing anatomy and um, finding it more and more fascinating how, how much it's actually functional science. It's not something static. Um, when I was looking at all the ligaments of the groin, I've actually counted more than 12 or at least 12 different ligaments that attach to the groin area. A lot of them are called after people that we have not met in our lifetimes and I'm just going to give you a little run through of all the ones that exist and some of the names you may have been asked by your older colleagues but maybe you're not quite that sure what they actually are and where they are so let's start with the most obvious one the the inguinal ligament and uh, the three lateral abdominal muscles that attach to it each one of them at a different part of the ligament and with a different part of the muscle itself. If you look at a sagittal view of the inguinal ligament, you see that it forms the floor of the inguinal canal. And on this view, you can also see some other interesting structures, which we will speak about a wee bit later on. The transversalis fascia and the uh, aponeurosis of the um, external oblique muscle, which actually forms the inguinal ligament at the bottom. This is another view of the same thing, just for those of you who have a little bit of problems with 3D imagination, so you see it from a different angle. You can see very well the iliopubic tract here, which often people mistake for the inguinal ligament. It's just the flimsier, little bit more inner part of it. And you see how the inguinal ligament splits the inguinal canal from the femoral area. Again, the same view of the same thing, just for those who would like to see it from slightly different, different view. This picture I find really interesting because uh, this is, although it's focusing on the groin area, it shows something extremely important for surgeons. And it's, it's highlighted in the red square. It's the linea alba, and while in many anatomical books it's uh, drawn as something very homogeneous, you see how non-homogeneous that actually is, and it's interlocked fibers from a whole lot of different muscles and aponeurosis, and it's very important to keep in mind, especially when you're closing the abdominal wall. Another little structure which is very close to the inguinal ligament is the handless ligament. I must confess, I have not found many differences between the handless ligament and the ligamentum reflexum. I think they are both roughly in the same area and I don't know if it has any clinical importance, if they are any different. But again, you see a different view of the inguinal canal and the handless ligament. For me, as a groin hernia surgeon, when I perform an open groin surgery, especially Liechtenstein, where I need to place a mesh and try to achieve some overlap over the pubic bone. These are the structures that very often get in my way and I'm sometimes a little bit lost how to deal with them. Should I try to push them, put the mesh behind them, above them, 
I think it's something that uh, some real anatomists maybe could help us with in the future. Interfibular ligament is something uh, which we maybe rarely hear about and we are taught that the um, epigastric vessels are actually the border between direct and indirect groin hernias. Um, it's not quite right. Uh, it's apparently the interfovel ligament and it explains something which we have been discussing very recently. How is it possible that some direct hernias go all the way to the scrotum? And it's because it's not that all the direct hernias go medially from the vessels. They go medially from the interfovel ligament and they can actually descend down along to the spermatic cord. Uh, the same, same ligaments, just a view from the inside. For those who prefer laparoscopic approach, this is something which you see a lot more often than when you do an open surgery. This ligament is very variable and it has some variable positions. So you can see it can be quite medially, quite laterally. It can overlap with the, with the vessels and it can be quite laterally in the groin as well. Apparently, um, according to some anatomic books, it's this ligament is what defines the internal um, annulus of the inguinal canal. We have all been taught about the triangle of Hasselbach, which is the area where the direct hernias enter the extraperitoneal space where the peritoneum sac goes protrudes through the abdominal wall. So this is just a little recapitulation for, for those of you who maybe are in the beginning of your training and you would like to repeat your anatomical knowledge. Tractus iliopubicus is uh, something, or the iliopubic tract is something I've mentioned before. It's just a little bit more inner part of the inguinal ligament. So here you can see it, it's basically in the very same place, but it's the thinner area that covers the vessels and here it's highlighted with a red arrow on the right side of the picture you can see it you can see the aponeurosis of the external oblique is flipped out there is the inguinal ligament and on the inside is the iliopubic tract just just there here it's on a cadaver again you see it it's very close to each other and it's basically a continuation of the same structure. And during an, a dissection of a cadaver, this is what you see. Number three is the iliopubic tract. Number two is the inguinal ligament. You see, while well, the inguinal ligament is quite thick, stiff structure, the iliopubic tract is relatively flimsy. It's very narrow if you're performing any Bassini or, or Magway or, or, sorry, any, um, yeah, Magway operations. It's very easy to perforate the the vessels that go very, uh, very close to it underneath it. Um, Cooper's ligament is something which um, is, is apparently always there, but we don't quite know what it is. Uh, this is just a, a diagram to show you where is the Cooper's ligament. Basically, it's under the inguinal ligament and uh, it's an area through which, which defines the area where the uh, where the femoral hernias can go they go between the inguinal ligament and the cooper's ligament and i'll show you some more pictures later on where they are shown conjoint tendon another thing which maybe you sometimes get bullied over and you get asked you know what is it where is it so Again, some anatomists say that maybe it's not uh, a structure that's all that reliable. A very famous surgeon said it doesn't exist. Conjoint tendon is something um, very simple. It's that arch, it's the aponeurotic arch, which you can feel, especially if you're operating, if you're doing any open suture repair of a groin hernia, you feel that we aponeurotic arch with your finger, if you, if you stick, uh, stick your finger in and it's the common uh, attachment of the transverse abdominis aponeurosis and the internal oblique aponeurosis. If they attach in one spot, it's called the conjoint tendon. Not all people have it. Some of them have two different attachments and the most outer layer is the superficial, is the external oblique aponeurosis seen here. 
here is the femoral canal, just a very simple drawing, uh, and that's depicting again the Cooper's ligament, which I have spoken before, spoken about before. You see the inguinal ligament, and you see the iliopubic tract. So if you don't like using mesh, if you don't want to put a plug in, or if you are not a laparoscopic surgeon and you decide to do a suture repair, that's basically there for you to be used to close the defect of the femoral canal. There is a femoral sheet that uh, lines the femoral canal and you can see the front part of it is formed by fascia trans transversalis, while the posterior layer is um, formed uh, from the fascia of the musculus iliopsoas, iliopsoas muscle. And something I have highlighted here on the picture on the top, you see that the transversalis fascia is not one structure. It has actually two layers, which are very important to identify because between them, you have all the vessels and the nerves. And if you are able to dissect during the laparoscopic approach in between them, you have much more uh, better chance to prevent any nerve injury. But um, Andrew is going to speak about that, I believe. There's not much need to speak about the myopectinal orifice. It's actually one of the most viewed lectures on base camp are the 10 golden rules of um, laparoscopic groin hernia repair. And it's all about the principles of the critical view of the myopectinal orifice. This is what it looks like. And it's important because there are nerves there, there are vessels there, and um, there are other hernias which you can find if you expose this orifice properly. So this is just some schematic picture and a photo from a laparoscopic surgery. The trigonum of doom, you all know there are blood vessels, trigonum of pain, the nerves going there. This is where it's important to stay in, uh, in the right layer of the transversalis fascia. And you see where the direct, indirect and femoral hernias can go through. So unless you obtain good view of this area, your laparoscopic surgery is very unlikely to be like the best that it can be. And I think we should not accept anything less than optimal. When you take down the peritoneum, this is your view and anything less than that is usually not enough to perform a good surgery. Just a very quick run through which structures are actually in each of this each of these triangles um, you see some very big vessels but also some relatively small but functionally critical vessels going through the trigonum of doom many nerves in the trigonum of pain and uh, i think robotic surgery has allowed us to see actually more things in there than what we were used to seeing during laparoscopic surgery just because of the magnification is um, is much bigger and better. And then there is a little area called the circle of death. Uh, it's not only a connection between the external leg artery and obturator artery. It can be even between the vein. And um, what I wanted to show you in this slide is that it's extremely variable. There is not one corona mortis. There is, there is many different variations of it. And you should never uh, just look and see, well, there is none, uh, none there, so it's safe to operate because you may find it one millimeter to the right or left, and uh, you can actually cause some huge hematomas. It's unlikely that these days you will kill somebody, but you can, you can get yourself in a very unpleasant situation. Many of you are um, asking, what is the sp uh, space of Retius? What is the space of Bogros? It's very simple. Both of them are pre-peritoneal spaces. One of them is in front of the bladder and uh, the space of Bogros is in the gro groin area. We speak about it more during the ETAP approach for you know, or ETAP tar for ventral hernias. For groin hernias, it's relatively straightforward and it's actually a great way how to learn, how to orientate yourself in those spaces is to do a lot of laparoscopic groin hernia surgeries. Here's just another picture of the same thing. And on the, uh, on the side, I have again highlighted these several layers of transversalis fascia. You see the first arrow on the top, that's peritoneum, then there is a little bit of fat, and then there is a 
the first layer, the visceral layer of the transversalis fascia, then all the structures you don't want to touch. And then there is the parietal layer of the transversalis fascia. So when you operate laparoscopically for groin hernia and you see a bare muscle, you are pretty, you have a pretty high chance that you have damaged something um, or at least touched something which you would have done better leaving untouched. When you operate on groin hernias, this is just a little plea from, from the EHS, please use the classification because only by that we can all speak the common language and we can compare our results. And last few slides I've dedicated to something which um, unfortunately we come across relatively often and we have people come to our offices with a groin lump and uh, not every groin lump is a hernia, so please be aware of it. While inguinal ultrasound is not usually the most recommended um, modality to, to test for groin hernias, when you have some mass in the groin, the groin ultrasound is something that, that is able to tell you quite accurately what you are actually looking at. And another thing is there is, um, it's not just about the groin masses and not just about the hernias. There's so many other things that influence your groin. So if you have a protrusion of an L5 or S1 disc, you, all your muscles around your spine will go into spasm. And that spasm will likely uh, transform, transform into some form of groin pain. This is not a neuro... A, a pain that's been transmitted by nerves. This is purely muscular pain that makes your groin stiff. There are many other muscles that attach to the groin area. So injury to any of these muscles, especially in people who are active in sports, but they don't have to be active sportsmen, will again will also present as a groin pain. So please do not operate everybody who comes with a groin pain and automatically assume that even if you can't feel anything or if they have some tiny little hernia that that's the cause of their problem so hopefully i have helped you understand a little bit more about uh, some basic anatomy of the groin and uh, you will know your your names and your structures a little bit better thank you thank you barbara very impressive talk. I have to admit that I don't know all the structures, so the anatomy is very complex. Uh, that's probably uh, the reason why surgeons are looking for very simple repair when where they don't have to understand and know all this anatomy and laparoscopy with mesh repair is probably a quite simple way of understanding the local anatomy. Uh, Andrew, do you have some comments yeah you and i both have uh, a gray hair so we've been around a long time and uh, i thought i knew my anatomy pretty well but sadly there's a few ligaments that i'd never heard of before um so it's always nice to be educated and that's you know going back to hernia base camp this is what it's all about it's not a them and us it's very much we all can learn uh, from these uh, events so barbara okay we have seen all these ligaments etc for you if you you have to initiate a surgeon to laparoscopic repair, any repair. What would be the focus? I don't think that you will talk about the two parts of the fascia transversalis, etc. So what is really the structure that you want to teach at first? And probably if the guy is interested in that, you can go in more details, trying to make him uh, like the uh, anatomy the way you do. But really teaching someone what are the most important ones? Well, um, it, it's funny you say that because when when I teach my residents how to do laparoscopic groin hernia repair, I actually usually start with that because we don't see so many recurrences anymore. And especially with the onset of laparoscopy, the recurrence rates mm -hmm. are relatively low. But what we really want to avoid is chronic pain. and. I think that's that actually should be like the number one thing that they go in and they they need to know where the nerves are how to avoid them because 
groin hernia operation is quality of life operation it's nothing else we we're not at least in europe we're not really saving lives with our daily job we are saving someone's quality of life and if you look at the numbers uh, some studies report up to 20 percent of chronic groin pain after open surgery after laparoscopy i'm not sure if we have the correct numbers but everybody we can save from that i think it's it's a life saved what, what, what is the reason for that <clears throat> i guess that the guys who are doing open anterior approach know probably a little bit the anatomy uh, and uh, wh why is this difference between open and laparoscopy in terms of chronic pain i don't know andrew if you can respond to that because logically we say we do intention free repair open or posterior so what can drive this difference in terms of chronic pain? Yeah, I think um, I'll touch to that briefly in my lecture as well. But, you know, Barbara talked about the triangle of pain, and that's very true for laparoscopic surgery. There's an area of concentrated nerves, but in the, as they then pass through, uh, through the abdominal wall muscles, then run in the inguinal canal. The problem with the open surgery is you can see um, a variety of nerves, but I would put it to you that it's an operative field of pain um, as opposed to uh, specific nerves. And then there's the nerves themselves, and then there's innervation. And it's been taught that stitching or putting tacks into Cooper's ligament is okay. But Barbara, what do you think about that in terms of these, these tendons, ligaments, aponeurosis, they're gonna have innervation. Um, and I think we should be careful where we put any sharp object. Well, I think so too. And we have very few anatomical studies looking into the structure of these things. So I think there were some studies made on round ligament and it actually proved there are no nerves going through it. But with the rest, and it's not, they, they don't go through the structures, but they go in this very thin layer of fat over it. And if you put, I mean, look at YouTube and look how people try to teach others how to do laparoscopic groin hernia repair and you it's not it's not rare you see 30 tags going in mm -hmm. all over the place and then we're debating is it even necessary in large m hernias to put that one tag medially you know and this is what what we are talking about yet most general surgeons just take it as a free shot Production to your lecture because uh, I think that you you're going to talk about this problem of uh, chronic pain if I'm right. Yeah, I wonder if we could get the uh, the slides up. This is an interesting uh, talk related not so much about the treatment of chronic pain, but this is more about is uh, chronic pain a uh, preventable complication, and I think um, that's an interesting concept. I don't know if I have the answer, but we'll discuss it and let's see if we come up with an answer uh, at the end and these are my disclosures and I don't think there's anything there that produces a conflict of uh, interest and talking about, I don't want to bash the authors of this paper in fact they are to be congratulated really on their results but this is talking about uh, safety inguinal hernia mesh is safe in a large number of patients so what do we mean by safe well let's see what these authors consider to be safe so they've done well there you know as a significant number of patients over about a 12-year period four surgeons so we're now talking about 150 operations a year between uh, four surgeons and they've done some careful work to follow them up and that already makes them unique most people most surgeons have not followed up their patients for any length of time and a very little idea of uh, outcomes and if we just focus on the results here it's the thing at five years postoperatively, only 3.9 percent that's one in 25 of patients reported severe or disabling sensation of mesh are we getting immune to chronic pain only? I don't know how you read that, only. Was it a little only or was it only? Because that's 3.9%. That's, that's one in 25 patients. Remember these surgeons were doing 150 operations a year. That's six a year that they were leaving with severe or disabling symptoms. And they are probably the better surgeons because they're following up their patients as well. So I put it to you that hernia surgery is perhaps not as safe as it goes. Now, we all like to blame our patients, and I'm a good at doing that myself, and I will, in my next few slides, blame the patient. But this uh, is an interesting editorial that came from my old boss uh, about the surgeon as a risk factor. 
And that this talk really is about the surgeon as a risk factor and the things that we can do to try and minimize chronic pain in our patients. Now, most of the uh, slides will show pictures of Scottish uh, beaches. Scotland is very uh, unique in that it has a climate very similar to the Caribbean, but without the hurricanes. So I do hope that you come and visit us in our beautiful beaches. But I'm going to talk a little bit about these four areas in the course of uh, this talk. Obviously, who's at risk of chronic pain? And I said I'd blame my patients, and these are the patients that, uh, that we know that you blame. Nothing to do with me. It's interesting, this excessive response to heat stimulus, and I'll come back to that uh, 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 shortly. But consent is quite important. Through my medical legal practice, I see patients who are unhappy with their surgeon. They had an asymptomatic hernia. They were told that their operation would be straightforward and they'd be back to work in a few weeks. And they ended up with chronic pain and they were very unhappy. And we have to be very honest with our patients that while the majority of operations do go well, some will not have an outcome that they wish. And in my medical legal practice, I don't see the patients that were warned of chronic pain, who get chronic pain, who then come back uh, with uh, a complaint. So our communication with patients, meeting their expectations is a start to stopping this chronic uh, pain. The other thing that uh, Barbara's already touched on was this um, patients that we all see, they're referred up because they've had an ultrasound scan, because they've got groin pain, it shows a very small hernia, and they're sent up for you or me to fix their hernia. And I would put it to you that their hernia is very unlikely to be cause of their groin pain or indeed uh, any other abdominal pain that's picked up along uh, the way. But surgery may have some benefit. There's a number of studies looking into this. This is one randomized trial that's going on in Europe. Recruitment has been slow because of COVID, but this might give us some handle on the outcome uh, for these patients. But symptomatic small hernias and small inverted commas because an ultrasound detected hernia, the clinical evaluation of the patient is very important. Now there's a lecture on this in hernia base camp, but to briefly recap, you have to think basically abdomen to pelvis down to the knees. So anything up with their back, their hips, their knees, is pelvic instability, obviously examine them, some, strim, uh, some straight leg raising and femoral nerve strep tests, look at the hip impingement, the fadir and the faber tests, check for adductor injuries are very common, there are a group of muscles that are easily damaged. And the last one looking for what's called Gilmore's groin is the straight arm uh, leg lift. A bit tricky to do because I'm not very good at doing it, but here's me trying to do it straight arms and then get your legs up. It was taught to me by an ex Manchester United uh, uh, doctor and this was if you're positive on raising your legs to pain in your groin and the other tests are all negative that's one of the few groups that may benefit uh, from groin surgery. And uh, bearing in mind this is another interesting uh, thing the Doha uh, meeting agreement when you come to looking at groin pain think of these different areas and they will tend to point you in the right direction and again Inguinal uh, related is the only really area that uh, us as hernia surgeons can fix. If we operate on the others, they will still have their pain and they may have the pain from our surgery. And now we're into a really uh, messy situation. So careful assessment of patients with groin pain and ultrasound detected hernia may keep you uh, out of trouble. What about operative uh, choices? So you have your patient, what operation are you going to do? Does it matter? Uh, when it comes to uh, chronic pain. This study is a little old now. Uh, it's an interesting study. It compares uh, Copenhagen with Stuttgart. Now it's not a randomized trial. In Copenhagen, they just did open uh, Liechtensteins. In Stuttgart, they did TAPPs. They assessed their patients for chronic pain. An interesting one of the key features was the heat rod stimulus for five seconds. And if the patient didn't complain or made no comment, then they were considered to have a low pain, a high pain threshold. And if they said, ouch, when the 47 degree uh, bar hit their arm, and there's the equipment to use it, they were considered to be at high risk of chronic pain. They went on to have surgery in their respective centers. And if you were at low risk of chronic pain, it didn't really matter what operation you had, you had a good outcome. But if you're at high risk, if you didn't like uh, uh, the uh, heat rod stimulus, then if you had open surgery, you are much more likely to end up with chronic pain. So if you're at risk of chronic pain, there seems to be a benefit of going down the laparoscopic uh, route. So that again, careful uh, patient selection is important. Barbara's mentioned a little bit about the nerves that are coming up and handling nerves is important. 
These were the hernia surge guidelines. Uh, uh, they're a big volume. You can see there's 165 pages of text. It was a whole edition of uh, the hernia uh, journal, but it's well worth a read. They're undergoing an update. Guidelines, they can upset a lot of people. And this is uh, one of my mentors in guidelines. Uh, it's an interesting editorial to read, but guidelines are not standards of care. They don't tell you what you have to do, but what they do do is allow you to be informed educated and bring that information and education to the discussion with your patients to then decide your course of action. So guidelines are nothing to be uh, uh, frightened of. And if any of you have your, uh, your phones ready, take a quick shot of that picture because that takes you to a facility on the European Hernia Society website where you can access all the guidelines and a whole lot of other information that will help you in uh, uh, hernia disease. So handling nerves, what do they say? Well, take care of them, look for them, not religiously, but you know uh, where they are. They are a variable a structure. And if we have a little look here, we can see the iliohypogastric nerve over the top and we can see the iliungal nerve below, but it's, it's splitting. It's running, uh, there's a branch that's running up into the uh, external oblique fascia. And that nerve is gonna be a problem. You're not gonna complete your Liechtenstein, that nerve there has to go. And there's another branch running along there. So just because you see one doesn't mean to see, say that you've seen uh, them all. They have a very variable structure, both in the retroperitoneum and in the groin. And there's a cadaver uh, dissection, again, of an iliangonal nerve. And this is the more conventional route running down the spermatic cord. But there are multiple branches, almost in the iliohypogastric territory, where you can cause uh, trouble along the way. So remember, they are very variable constantly be on the lookout for them. If you do uh, uh, injure them, then they're probably best divided, or if they're stretched, uh, divide them. And obviously you need to be careful with the cut nerve. Make sure that cut stump is not gonna be involved in the scar tissue. It's not gonna be involved in the scar tissue around the mesh, or indeed the scar tissue from the operation itself. It obviously goes without saying that we need to be careful with the vasculature, and I will come back to that shortly as to how that can impact on chronic uh, pain. Because acute pain is important. Patients can wake up with a lot of pain, and this is an interesting study. Uh, looking at that in terms of uh, a large questionnaire base uh, in, in, in Sweden, showing that chronic pain or acute pain was relatively low, but when it happened, it had an impact. So what happened in the OR, what happened in the early post-operative period had a big impact on the outcome of the patient. The operative risk of chronic pain is seven and a half times higher if you have severe acute uh, pain. So what's the diagnosis when your patient wakes up in agony and uh, they're unhappy? Well, it's highly unlikely they have a low pain threshold. And I also ruled out infection for the most part because in the first 24 hours, infection is unusual. unusual. But think of these other uh, areas. Urinary retention, it is easily forgotten. Many patients will pass urine, but it's overflow, you're not emptying the bladder properly. We now have the ability to scan uh, 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 the bladder to, to see if it's uh, full, although post uh, laparoscopic repairs, it can be a little bit difficult. If in doubt, catheterize. Bleeding, bleeding is not usually painful. It can look quite impressive. It can look quite dramatic, but it's generally not a cause of pain after uh, surgery. We've already discussed some of the things about uh, how to handle a divided nerve and nerves that are stretched, but be careful actually during the insertion of mesh. Air knots, it's, you're not trying to stop bleeding at this point, you're just trying to secure the mesh. If the mesh is getting puckered, then you've probably tied the knots too tight. It's easy doing open surgery to sew from toe to head or head to toe, and therefore you're more unlikely to circle uh, the, um, the nerve. So be careful with suturing, because that's when there can be uh, some problems. Clearly, vascular-wise, the patient wakes up, they can either have a very sore uh, uh, testicle, or indeed, sometimes it's just a deep-seated abdominal pain. The gentlemen who've had uh, testicular injuries in the past will know what I'm talking about. If the artery's gone, well, it's too late. But if they do have severe pain, either in their testicle or in their abdomen, go back and open them up. And you'll often find this very dramatic, if, the, if there's venous ischemia, they have these very dilated veins, as big as the uh, vas, and it's usually the deep ring is too tight or there's a suture in the wrong place and it's occluding uh, the backflow. So what do you do? Obviously, at open surgery, it's relatively straightforward. You take them back to theater, you open them up. If it's clearly a vascular problem, you deal with it. If it's not a vascular problem, I would suggest you take all the sutures out 
all the uh, mesh out. If you have divided some nerves, check for that you've, that you've buried them and redo the operation a bit more carefully, maybe thinking about glue uh, rather than sutures. Laparoscopically, severe pain, I really don't know uh, what to do. Whatever has caused the pain has happened and uh, it may not be reversible unless you've, you've used penetrating fixation, then maybe taking that fixation out uh, may help. So chronic pain, is it preventable? I think there's lots of things that surgeons can do to try and minimize it. Now I've quoted very few studies and I appreciate that. And surgery is not strictly a sport, although it's part of a sport, it's an art and a science. And, and those of you who remember the Sky Racing team, they focused on little things. They focused on the design of the helmet, the design of the clothing, things, simple things to do with the bike and became unbeatable. And we have to focus on little things during our operations, around our decision making, and what happens afterwards to try and minimize the risk of uh, uh, chronic pain. Clearly, as, as, as Secretary General of the European Hernia Society, I can't finish this talk without a plug to join the European Hernia Society. These are the benefits of being a member. You can't read that text, you're not supposed to, but there are many opportunities there. And clearly, uh, it's a, a real delight to be part of the team behind Hernia Basecamp. I think that picture shows us an order, Ruth leading from the front, uh, Barbara very strongly supporting her, and me on my knees trying to uh, keep up with uh, two very clever uh, women driving the system. We need to know our results. We don't know if we've got chronic pain or whatever if we don't know our results. And a plug for the registry, collect your data, whether it's through the EHS registry or others, is very important. And clearly at a very difficult time, Hernia Base Camp is for the world over and at a very difficult time for our friends in Ukraine. We should remember them in their time of trouble. And that brings me to the end. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this uh, very impressive lecture and uh, uh, with a lot of information. You're talking in general about inguinal hernia, uh, not specifically to one technique or the other technique. We have, you know better than me, how many techniques we have for repairing hernias. When we're talking about laparoscopy and uh, Liechtenstein, because these are the two that are uh, the most uh, common today, what about pain in these two different uh, techniques? Uh, I know that you've been working on the guidelines uh, and what are the some of the message of the guidelines regarding this pain this acute and chronic pain if we are looking at the two different techniques the most common techniques yeah one of the difficulties of chronic pain is it can be measured in lots of different ways and what we tend to find is that enthusiasts running trials generally show, show that chronic pain is less with an endoscopic approach compared to an open approach. When we look at population data, that difference seems to narrow somewhat. So clearly there are some surgical expertise that is adding uh, to the risk of, uh, of chronic pain uh, within that. So that's an important area. The surgeon here is an important risk factor. And <clears throat> when you're looking precisely at this topic, so the surgical experience, what are the main difference, Barbara mentioned that uh, sometimes she's looking at videos on YouTube and you, you see the guys putting uh, 30 uh, staplers to, to fix the mesh. So do you think that's the only reason that can make the difference between a good surgeon with few incidents of chronic pain and a surgeon who should probably learn a little bit more in the hernia base camp? Yeah, because it's, it's not, what, what's, yeah. what makes the difference between the two? number of, st of uh, staples or, no. or stitch or whatever no 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 it's not just about the sutures or staplers it's about the use of the tools about when, when i trained i had a i had a teacher who always told me that our operating has to be physiological and it has mm -hmm. to be in the right layers and so often you see surgeons who behave like a bulldozer a little bit yeah. they just bulldoze in and everything that's in their way they destroy but this is not how at least the hernia surgery should look like and because the anatomy is not all that straightforward it's not the same with everybody i think maybe operating slower think more and really not be embarrassed for being a hernia surgeon and and learn and and get better at it you know everybody wants to do cancer surgery but a lot of people say well you know hernia surgery is something everybody can do it's not true. Not everybody can do correct hernia surgery. It's, is it probably the problem of uh, inguinal hernia surgery? 
which is usually the first procedure that we teach to our residents, young residents, and they are starting the surgical experience on hernia because everybody is considering hernia as uh, just uh, some sort of surgery. So, what is what's your opinion on uh, and yeah, the I impact think... that can have on the big uh, yeah. picture on the nationwide results? that says okay we have a problem you're right pain. hernia surgery is still seen as a training operation and there's nothing wrong with it as a training operation mm -hmm. if the trainer is appropriately trained mm -hmm. and we see that you know i can speak of my own country in the in the uk that about 25 percent of hernias are done by surgeons who do less than five a year mm -hmm. and um, in other countries that percentage is even higher where we've accepted for most cancer surgery and indeed benign uh, upper GI surgery and the like, that five a year is, is grossly inadequate. That, that is not appropriate. And because hernia is seen in the remit of general surgery, and I think we're grateful to the, to the UAM is now recognizing abdominal wall surgery as a separate area of interest. As you train, you have this enthusiasm to train, and then you get to a point of competence, but not expertise. And if your training stops at that point, because you continue HBB, esophagastric, mm -hmm. colorectal, you end up as an expert in there, but your mediocrity or area of mediocrity in hernia surgery continues. And yet, because you have now finished your training, you become a trainer uh, and, and you haven't reached that uh, pinnacle in a sense of, of expertise. Yeah. And you then uh, end up uh, hurting patients. This analyzes probably a good uh, support for the project of Hernia Basecamp, no? It's trying to get the teacher aware of what they're doing, no? Yeah, and I think uh, we see the results already. We see it's the, the number of participants are growing exponentially and they're from all over the world. And uh, I hope that it's more younger people who are not going to be just as big headed yeah. as yeah. some of the older surgeons who probably didn't take hernia surgery serious enough when they were in their training. So the new generation of surgeons who will really put the quality of life of their patients on the pedestal and this is what they want to achieve with their operating. They don't want to do, I don't know, so many hernias or something. They want to improve life of so many people and that should be our goal. Yeah. I think that's, that's a problem in different specialties really to try to get the best of what you can do in this precise, precise field. You're doing upper GI, you're doing hernia, you're doing colorectal, you have to focus on that and know what you're doing. And that's why probably the, the hernia surgery, which is a secondary surgery, has been a little bit left on the side. Yeah, and much I think of that um... the, this, this sort of initiative, uh, pushing, putting the light on, 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 on the basics and uh, anatomy and the, the problem of uh, quality of life, etc. is very interesting. And this is probably one of the important issues regarding this uh, NRB scan. And for the people who are watching this, uh, this uh, webinar, I think that sometimes you can see a QR code appearing on the NRB scan. And if you flash on that, uh, you will get access directly to the NRB scan uh, on the website. So please, please feel free to, to go through. So uh, I know probably uh, that your preference is going for laparoscopy, I think, if I'm right, because I've been working a little bit with you on the hernia base cam, just looking at what you're doing. So we know that if in Germany there are a lot of people using laparoscopy for hernia repair, I'm going to Sweden, there are very few people, maybe in England, it's very viable. So for you, what is the main difference uh, between open, any types of robot, of course, we're talking about Liechtenstein and laparoscopy. How can you defend laparoscopy? Maybe in some precise indication, we do uh, repair in women, uh, all these indications that have been highlighted by the, uh, the guidelines. Uh, how do you how do you see this? Uh, yeah, one of the one of, of the difficulties of guidelines um, is that, for example, one of the guidelines suggests that after a failed anterior repair, then laparoscopic repair is uh, uh, recommended. Now it's recommended because you're going through fresh tissue. But if the reason for doing the original operation was because laparoscopic surgery was contraindicated, multiple previous laparotomies, patient was not fit for general anesthetic, that kind of thing, 
then suddenly saying, well, let's do it laparoscopically second time round doesn't make sense either. So sometimes it'll be anterior first time, anterior at second time round. And the other thing, if a guideline says laparoscopic is a good plan, doesn't mean to say that we all just jump on the bandwagon. And unfortunately, many of our patient gets injured during our learning curve. So again, some countries who adopted laparoscopic surgery earlier have enough, have the volume of, of surgeons who can then pass it on to the next uh, uh, group. Barbara, what is your feeling? Well, we, we all got used to having all gallbladders removed laparoscopically and it's sort of accepted that to do a laparotomy in the subcostal area or to do upper midline just to get a gallbladder out is not really acceptable in, in Europe anymore. And uh, I really wish that the same move happened with, with groin hernias slowly. Uh, as Andrew said, there are some people that just should not have laparoscopic approach, but there are not that many of them. So. I think once we accepted that maybe open groin hernia repair will diminish from the traditional training operation spectrum, we will see more young surgeons being trained in the laparoscopic approach. Laparoscopic repair for hernia is 30 years old. And comparing to that to other surgery that we've done laparoscopy, you mentioned cholecystectomy, there's for good surgery, etc. We can see that the the development of hernia is a little bit slower. What, what is the reason for that? Is it probably not equipment because the other types of surgery have grown? Um, is it knowledge of the anatomy? Or is it the type of anesthesia that is required for day surgery? What, what are probably the, 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 the more pertinent arguments that would explain why I suppose, yeah, replace, so I suppose the short answer is I don't really know, and it'll be very, very much by countries. But you need you need someone to who knows how to do it to then teach the next generation or the current generation. And you know, I can speak of uh, the NHS in, in my own country, but we're under so much pressure now that the emphasis is doing on the, the quickest operation, which is generally the operation you can do, and time for training, whether that's robotic, laparoscopic, or indeed open, no matter what it is. Is, is put under a lot of pressure. We have, we're overwhelmed with work and it's doing the quickest operation that we can do. But where I do see open surgery coming back, and again, the UK is perhaps leading the field in this, is the mesh concern by our patients, the demand by the public to have a non-mesh repair. And that in my practice has been a resurgence in open uh, non-mesh repairs, driven by patients who after you have all the discussion, about recurrence, chronic pain, and what have you, not being affected uh, um, uh, by mesh to any great extent, uh, but they still say we want a non-mesh repair. So that is a swing for me away from laparoscopic surgery. Which makes absolutely no sense, given the fact that you're using exactly the same material, you're placing a lot more stitches in, and the difference is maybe one gram of polypropylene. It's just a misunderstanding of the it issue. Is a, it is a misunderstanding, but at the same time, it's a discussion that is that you have to have with the patients. At the end of the day, they are making the ultimate choice as to what you do. And uh, we all accept that patients will sometimes make unusual treatment decisions, whether it's to have a, a cancer operation or not have a cancer operation. So hernia is no different. We have to involve our patients in, in what's going I mean, there's, on. There is one indication for uh, laparoscopic surgery is uh, femoral hernia in women and this is something that is quite interesting because can you comment on on this problem yeah, because this is quite evidence for the laparoscopic yeah. repair so what looks like is that women have an early recurrence rate after open surgery and it's probably not a recurrence it's a misdiagnosis so that inguinal hernia was operated on when it was femoral or the femoral was operated on when it was inguinal um, and therefore the benefit of, of laparoscopic surgery is you don't really have to know what type of hernia it is because you see all the orifices and you you deal with it appropriately so women are a particular group having said that um, women pose a problem after cesarean sections particularly if their peritoneum hasn't been closed and often the the the, the muscle the rectus muscle is not clad with peritoneum which is a challenge to laparoscopic surgery and getting closure or cover of your mesh afterwards so it's again it's not a simple thing women should have a laparoscopic repair yeah i definitely agree unfortunately we see from the data 
that women are less likely to be offered laparoscopic surgery than men because surgeons automatically assume that men want to return back to activity while for women it's not so important okay very interesting <clears throat> um you you mentioned mesh I, I, i'm okay I'm, I'm not that active in hernia surgery anymore but uh, being involved in that a uh, long time um, we consider today that open mesh repair primary open mesh repair Oh, open no, primary repair of fingernail hernia in adult patient is mesh, both for the yeah. and for la laparoscopy. Yeah, everybody agrees on that. So, um, what is the problem with the mesh? And you mentioned some patient willing to have a mesh, no, non mesh repair. What are the base for this uh, decision? Uh, probably type of mesh that was used or complication with mesh what is pain you mentioned pain i think surgeons are also partly to blame it's laparoscopy uh, or is well it, 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 it's it's open? both but it is more of a problem with open surgery and i think it's uh, it's been driven by the idea that uh, if someone comes back with a poor outcome we say it's probably your mesh and the patient goes away doctor tells me it's my mesh and i see lots of patients who come to me and the first thing i say to them what can i do for you and they go it's my mesh doctor mm -hmm. and i say well it might be your mesh but tell me your story and let's work out what's going on so there's a focus towards a thing which is a driver the mesh story has come through gynecological surgery one in ten women uh, after right. gynecological surgery do have a bad outcome and it's we're all tarred with the same brush in a sense from that okay, point of view so this uh, mesh yeah. in general yeah. yeah, I have men coming to see me whose wives have told them not to have mesh because it's a terrible thing. Yeah, which is a terrible and Scottish thing. husbands always do what their wives tell them. Yeah, yeah. it's a very mm. different topic. Mm. So, can you comment on that? Do you um, do you do you have the feeling that, in your experience, uh, you are more comfortable using a mesh in laparoscopy because you have to, or are you still using some uh, doing some? Uh, non mesh repair in open surgery? Well, when I started my training, mesh was basically too expensive for us to use. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of Magway procedures, a lot of Marcy procedures, mm -hmm. and uh, we were drilled in, in anatomy and layers. And we were told if you put the stitch here, you will cause this. If you put the stitch there, you'll cause this. So I think doing a lot of suture repairs makes you more aware of what you can cause as a like bad things that you can cause. Also in my country, you can't hide if you operate on a patient. It's not like in the NHS where you have a secretary, mm -hmm. which is basically your bodyguard. You. They come straight, they can walk from uh -huh. the street straight to your office. They can find out where you live. So um, it's very hard to hide from an angry patient. But unlike the UK, we don't have the anti-mesh propaganda. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's partly because uh, a lot of people believe that the mesh causes things which it doesn't really cause because they are not treated for their original condition. So like we see a lot about autoimmunity in mesh and we have just recently finished a paper which um, shows that also non-mesh procedure does um, bring the onset of autoimmunity. It's, it's, it's the genetics, mm -hmm. it's not the material. <clears throat> it's something wrong with the patient and they need to be seen, they need to be treated correctly. Sometimes the mesh can be taken out or has to be taken up and it helps them, but it's an extremely small proportion of patients. And while in some countries they get that care and some other countries, some very aggressive patient groups that um, just create this cult of anger and, mm -hmm. and uh, that fuels that anti-mesh thing a lot as well. We luckily don't don't experience that yet. Yeah. Okay. I think that um, yeah, we're coming progressively to the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, I will start with Andrew. Just final words regarding this uh, first session on the uh, inguinal and repair. Well, I hope everyone has enjoyed it. I hope everyone has learned something. I certainly have. I've learned some new ligaments in the groin. Yeah. And I will look out for them in the future and point them out. And I will take my residents and ask them what they are. And if they don't know, they'll be sent to the naughty step. But no, I think uh, it's, uh, you know, anything that can promote quality hernia learning and hernia base camp is in there. Uh, we do need the audience to participate, tell us what's good, what's not so good. And if there are people out there who think there's a lecture missing, 
let us know and if they wish to uh, to actually create that lecture yeah. delighted for them to come on board yeah i think it's very important to remind that we're talking about the most common procedure in the world yeah so uh, this is quite important so barbara your conclusion well, um, I would like to, and Andrew has done it already, but I'd like to invite everybody to join the European Hernia Society. I think we're the friendliest bunch of surgeons out there. I we're really, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we love to get people involved. If you're young, if you're enthusiastic about something, if you want to write guidelines together with us or just come for the conferences, just don't be shy. Come speak to us, write us an email, join and uh, I promise we will teach you everything we know and we will do our best to make you feel welcomed. I have a question for both of you. I'm a young surgeon. I have some problem with my laparoscopic and repair or my open and repair. Can I send you a video and you comment and teach me? Is um, it something that yeah. is included in the Ernia Base Camp? This well, possibility of uh, it's yes. something we were mm. talking about yeah. today, actually, and we would like to include it in the next so episode. It's, it's going to come, okay. but uh, also what we do do is we run courses and you can just come and join any before every every Congress. We run a course, we have basic course, we have advanced course, and we try to teach everybody the most basic and the most important parts that we Perfect. believe improve the outcomes. So full package. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And looking forward to the next episode. Thank you and have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. to present an exciting new learning platform. Are you finding it tough to track down reliable information for hernia surgery? Do you want to hear from world-leading experts in one simple, easy to navigate, unbiased and accredited place? Then welcome to Hernia Basecamp. Simple to navigate, you can watch videos, recorded webinars and conference lectures, all supported with suggested reading. It's a completely free of charge online resource for everyone with an interest in hernias. An educational program with three main aims, eight chapters and the world's leading experts with certification on completion. You can attend lectures, view videos or look up information. Keeping you up to date with the latest views and technology via a user friendly interactive platform. We're taking hernia care further together. So visit websurge.com and start your journey today. WebSurge is proud to present an exciting new learning platform. Are you finding it tough to track down reliable information for hernia surgery? Do you want to hear from world-leading experts in one simple, easy-to-navigate, unbiased and accredited place? Then welcome to Hernia Basecamp. Simple to navigate, you can watch videos, recorded webinars and conference lectures, all supported with suggested reading. It's a completely free of charge online resource for everyone with an interest in hernias. An educational program with three main aims, eight chapters and the world's leading experts with certification on completion. You can attend lectures, view videos or look up information. Keeping you up to date with the latest views and technology via a user-friendly interactive platform. We're taking hernia care further together. So visit websurge.com and start your journey today. WebSurge is proud to present an exciting new learning platform. Are you finding it tough to track down reliable information for hernia surgery? Do you want to hear from world-leading experts in one simple, easy-to-navigate, unbiased and accredited place? Then welcome to Hernia Basecamp. 
Simple to navigate, you can watch videos, recorded webinars and conference lectures, all supported with suggested reading. It's a completely free of charge online resource for everyone with an interest in hernias. An educational program with three main aims, eight chapters and the world's leading experts, with certification on completion. You can attend lectures, view videos or look up information, keeping you up to date with the latest views and technology via a user-friendly interactive platform. We're taking hernia care further together. So visit websearch.com and start your journey today. WebSurge is proud to present an exciting new learning platform. Are you finding it tough to track down reliable information for hernia surgery? Do you want to hear from world-leading experts in one simple, easy to navigate, unbiased and accredited place? Then welcome to Hernia Basecamp. Simple to navigate, you can watch videos, recorded webinars and conference lectures, all supported with suggested reading. It's a completely free of charge online resource for everyone with an interest in hernias. An educational program with three main aims, eight chapters and the world's leading experts with certification on completion. You can attend lectures, view videos or look up information. Keeping you up to date with the latest views and technology via a user friendly interactive platform. We're taking hernia care further together. So visit websurge.com and start your journey today. WebSurge is proud to present an exciting new learning platform. Are you finding it tough to track down reliable information for hernia surgery? Do you want to hear from world-leading experts in one simple, easy-to-navigate, unbiased and accredited place? Then welcome to Hernia Basecamp. Simple to navigate, you can watch videos, recorded webinars and conference lectures, all supported with suggested reading. It's a completely free of charge online resource for everyone with an interest in hernia.